He has excelled as one of the best in college football under very unique and trying circumstances, and now is officially the best, according to the Broyles Award. Defensive coordinator Phil Parker, congratulations to him. Well earned, no question. Welcome to Hawkeyes Live right here at the Voice of College Football. Corey Brad is here, of course, to break down the Hawkeyes with us. Join Corey at the from the Hawkeye of the Storm. Corey, how are you doing today? Doing good, Mark. We've come to the end of the uh, regular season, and uh, the, the selection shows behind us. Bowl selections are behind us, so um, this is, I guess, when it really gets busy because now you have the transfer portal. <laughs> so, but it is what it is. I'm really happy for Phil Parker. Uh, man, long overdue for that that guy. And uh, I, <laughs> I saw some people already, Michigan fans. Ah, I messed up. <laughs> I'm like, do you realize? First of all, do you realize? Go back and look at the game on Saturday. What did Moore's unit do versus Phil Parker's unit? Go back and look at those numbers. If we really want to make that argument, go back and look at those numbers. All right? As bad as Iowa's offense is, that defense played absolutely incredible on Saturday. And this is not a one-game award. But this is what Phil Parker's defense, as you alluded to earlier, has done for so long. In the face of such difficult circumstances, I felt like Saturday was kind of a microcosm of that, and a great way for that defense to finish the regular season. What a, what a unit! What a coaching job by Phil Parker once again, along with you know, Seth Wallace and Jay Neiman and Kelvin Bell and all those guys who are coaching. So, congratulations to Phil. Well deserved and well overdue. When you started that uh, take on the Michigan fan base, I thought you were going to point to them. Uh, thinking that their defensive coordinator should have won the award. I understand that uh, the other three finalists were offensive coordinators, including Sharon Moore of Michigan, which I'm a bit surprised at that, uh, at that nomination. Not that he did not do a fine job there at Michigan and not that they don't rank in the top 10 or 15 in the country in, just about all the offensive categories aside from passing offense. They're not a pro prolific passing offense, nor have they chosen to go that direction. So that's part of it. But uh... And Iowa held them to 1.9 yards per rush on Saturday, Mark. Yeah. You know, just really. Which incredible. included sack yardage. Of course, but the, yeah, great. But that's just how we track things. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's an astounding number. Yeah, it is. And, and you know, the, the bottom line is, um, you know, Iowa's offense is terrible. Like right? We say the same thing every week. It's just awful. And so which unit was worse? Uh, Iowa's offense was worse than Michigan's offense. Um, I think that's that's fair to say. But the fact that, uh, you know, Iowa's offense is just bad against everybody and Michigan's offensive coordinator was one of five finalists for the Broyles Award. Boy, that says something about Iowa's defense and Iowa's de special teams unit. Unfortunately, you know, we talked about that heading into the game. If Iowa was going to have a chance, which I thought they did, special teams had to win. And you can't give up an 87-yard return. Um, you know, that was kind of like the nail in the coffin, even though that was a first-half play. It was like, okay, defense is doing everything it can. Certainly the three turnovers just snowballed the whole thing. But Iowa lost this game because of an inept offense that couldn't do anything and turn the ball over and one big play given up by special teams. That's it. That That's really, the defense really didn't give up anything. And um, so, you know, once again, we're in the same spot we were a year ago, you know, where you have to, to go and improve to take that next step. Because as long as Phil Parker's here, this defense is going to be really good. And you know, unless there are significant changes with philosophy and play calling and scheme, the offense is not going to be uh, to a level where it can compete on that stage. You know, we, we've talked about it for so long, but like what we saw Saturday was just further evidence that you cannot beat the best teams, even in the Big Ten, with this style. You can't. And when I say this style, I'm not talking about, you know, field position and, you know, utilizing your special teams unit. And, you know, I, I understand that has worked in the past against some of the better opponents in the country, but you cannot do that with this level of offense. You just can't. You can win a lot of games like this, especially in this division and even in this conference as a whole. They beat Rutgers out of the East 
My guess is they probably would have beaten Maryland. We don't know that. They would have beaten Indiana. I mean, there's other teams outside of the division. I don't think people realize that there are bad teams in a lot of divisions, including the Big Ten East. But you cannot expect to compete and beat teams like Penn State, Ohio State, Michigan with this type of style and offense. You just can't. There's just not enough... There's not enough defense to go around. There's not enough special teams to go around. If Iowa's special teams unit had played perfect, perfect on Saturday, because the defense basically played perfect. I mean, in large part, it basically played perfect. The special teams unit plays perfect. I think they still lose. It might be close because I don't know how, you know, who knows. But I don't think it would have made a 26-point difference. They scored zero points. You know, I mean, you just can't win scoring zero points. (laughs) You just can't do it. And you hope that your defense, you know, the one thing the defense didn't do Saturday was they did not convert on a couple of opportunities. Nick Jackson had an opportunity at an interception. He just dropped. And I don't know if he would have taken it back to the house. He had green in front of him. No missed opportunity. But in general, are we really relying on the defense to score? In the past, they have. And it's worked in some bigger games. But when they're not getting that type of production, you have no chance when you have this type of offense. I would have to scour my brain or I could just simply go on the internet and go to all the championship results in every conference. But I believe that is the first shutout in any conference championship game in the history of power five football, going back to 1992, the first sec championship game, not just in the big 10. I think that is the first shutout. So that underlines how, incredibly atrocious that offense is and you made a comment about style and it's not that i disagree with you about the style uh, because i do think that they need to be more creative but michigan plays in a similar style as iowa from an offensive standpoint they're just better they just have more dynamic players they've coached the offensive line better they've just developed their players they've recruited better players and then they've coached them better on that side of the ball yeah and when i said style i meant that's why i kind of corrected that style when you have this bad of an offense like you better get creative if you're going to have this bad of an offense you you can't just do what you're doing and have you know like you said the the problems everyone's talking about the the development of the offensive line i mean i went back and listened to part of one of the post game shows i think it was after wisconsin the other day and there were callers i mean there was one guy that called in and you know i love our callers they're, they're great as you love your callers but this one guy i mean he just rattled off every phase of the game oh the offensive line was amazing and brian called a great game and the linebackers just dominated oh i'm just so happy and it's like okay you're a homer that's fine but the fact of the matter is, go back to the Big Ten Awards, not a single O-lineman was named to an All-Big Ten team. That's concerning. Not a, not a first team, not a second team All-Big Ten. Maybe they got a third team All-Big all Ten lineman. I'd have to go back and look. But that, that's not good. I mean, when you're talking about an Iowa team that is supposed to be known for offensive line play, and you got a bunch of guys that they just say, ah, we'll give them an honorable mention. That line is still not even close to where it needs to be. And so those are problems. And, you know, th- what's crazy about Saturday, Mark, and this is the first time you and I have spoken face to face about this game. What's crazy about Saturday is it played out like exactly the way we kind of thought it would. And as Iowa fans kind of feared it would. Like it's so predictable. It's not like 20, it's not like the game result was like, wow, look at what Michigan did. It's like, this is what we expected. The Iowa defense is going to show up. The Iowa offense wasn't going to do anything. I gave, I tried to give Brian Ferentz a benefit of the doubt going into the game because I thought he'll do something different. Like play calling, he'll have wrinkles ready. They didn't do anything different, Mark. I didn't see him look down the field. <laughs> what was your score? Crap. What was your score prediction? Uh, I had 23-13. Oh, 13 points. Yeah, I had, well, <laughs> here, here's the deal. Uh, at some point, I expected to be able to get in field goal range and convert on one or two good punt plays, which Torrey Taylor played really well. And then maybe you get a, a pick six or you break a big run like Iowa's done a couple of times. But but it's not – it wouldn't be crazy if you had told me beforehand I was going to get shut out. I wouldn't have called you crazy. And honestly, people may disagree with this. I think if they don't give up 
the 87 yard punt return, maybe they only lose by 10 or 15. I know they lost by 26, but I do think that has a significant difference. But they would have, I think that would have lost either way. I want to make that clear. So that's kind of where I was thinking as far as prediction is concerned. Definitely, Corey, make that clear. You don't want any Michigan fans coming after you. So make that clear that you still believe that Iowa. <laughs> I'm making it clear. And I wouldn't want them to confuse yeah, no. that in any way. Um, yeah, I'll give Michigan fans credit. Uh, I have had less flack and less pushback. There was there were less Michigan fans on the show, the post game show Saturday than I expected. Now there's, as you know, when you get these big shows that everybody's tuning in for, you can't get through all the chats. So, and I didn't see everything, but I'll give Michigan fans credit. A lot of people were just relentless heading into the game. I have not heard as much post game. And why? What, what do you have to brag about? I mean, you won the game. Your offense didn't really do anything. You dominated a bad Iowa offense. You did win special teams. And that 87-yard play, that is, somebody asked me during the game, what's the play of the game? Who's the player of the game? I was sitting next to somebody from, I think it was the Indianapolis Star or some Indianapolis outlet next to me who didn't have a horse in the race. I mean, he was just a local reporter covering it in press box. And him and I were chatting. And, of course, the Big Ten wanted credentialed media to vote on player of the game. And he asked me, well, who's player of the game? And I'm like, well, it's not Corum. It's not McCarthy. It's nobody specifically on defense. I just said, you know, it's the guy who returned the 87 yard punt because <laughs> that was the biggest play in the game, in my opinion. Uh, if I'm a, you know, I'm not going to select Tory Taylor on a team that got shut out. Um, so, and, and I think Michigan's punter, they, I don't know how many times they punted, but my guess is his numbers were okay. Um, they certainly weren't what Tories were. And, uh, so I, I give Jim Harbaugh credit to uh, two years ago. There was some criticism, even from Don Patterson about kind of how they carried themselves late in that game, kind of tried to run up the score. I don't know that they would have been able to run up the score on, on Saturday, had a fourth and one in field goal range, right up 23 zero. And the smart play was to kick a field goal. And that's what he did. You know, just put it away, put it up by more than three scores. The game's over at that point. So I give Jim, Jim Harbaugh credit for that. Um, but uh, now you, you know, turn the table, turn the page to Tennessee. And, uh, you know, this is probably strength against strength with Tennessee's offense versus Iowa's defense. And a guy who's got strong connections to Iowa, uh, their head coach, of course, coached with Bob Stoops down at Oklahoma, coached with Jay Norvell, and I think played for, uh, well, he would have played for uh, Chuck Long down at Oklahoma and knows Mike and Bobby from Oklahoma coached against Iowa in the 2011 Insight Bowl. Uh, that was a win for Oklahoma. So strong connections there should be an interesting game and a sunny destination, at least for Iowa fans. See, late in that game, I was just hoping I didn't have any money on the game, but just I make my predictions. And uh, I was just hoping at 23 nothing that Iowa could just, just kick a field goal. Just kick a field goal. I, I took Iowa in 22 in my predictions. Just kick a field goal. But uh, they, they couldn't get that accomplished. And uh, I have not checked the chat, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised if somebody corrected me. Uh, this was a miss on my part that should have been pretty obvious to me when I said I cannot think of any. And I got a pretty good recollection of all conference championship game scores throughout history. There was one in the Big Ten that I should have obviously been able to get because it led to a national championship. Ohio State 59, Wisconsin nothing. Zero. Yeah. I was, so, we were talking that about was that, that one. Uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, it, it, it did go as scripted. I believe that you're correct in, in citing that punt return by Samaj A. Morgan as the play of the game. Now, when I was asked, or I probably wasn't asked because I don't know that a lot of people were hitting me up about the big 10 championship game as we went live after the game, as you can imagine on my show, it was all about the college football playoff and who's going to get selected and all that business. But I, in recapping all the games and what I had seen, I thought the backbreaker, but again, you are correct to give Michigan a two score lead at that point versus I thought the backbreaker was the reversed call uh, that should not have been reversed on the right. blind side hit. Uh, that was a, a, a bad call. You notice I have not brought up officiating one time. I mean, I we're 50 minutes in, and you're bringing it up. Officiating was not good. That was a bad call. Um, and, you know, 
I know a lot of people disagreed with this take, but I was critical of Brian after the game for going nuts like he did. I just thought it's just, you know, time and place. You're not going to get that call overturned. If Kirk wants to go nuts, let him go nuts. Brian's back is already up against the wall. It's the final game, final Big Ten game he gets to coach as the Iowa offensive coordinator. He didn't bring anything to the table that we saw on Saturday. So I don't care about hearing people praising Brian because he went nuts. I'm not going to praise him. Yeah, it was it was a bad call. Yeah, did it make a difference? Yeah, it did. Of course it did. But again, you know, I, I just thought it was a bad look. And I'm, again, up, way up in the press box, and I didn't have – one thing I didn't bring were binoculars, but I could see Brian. I mean, you could tell it was Brian down there just losing his marbles. And I thought, boy, just given the the game, what game it is, the score, don't you just hold it back. But that's my opinion. Um, and trying to think there was what was the other controversial call? There was the the one where the, the fumble that was overturned. Which, which, by the way, I, I still I haven't gone back and watched the game on television yet, so that's one thing I'll probably need to do at some point. But, like, I thought the play was blown dead. The play was blown dead. And I don't remember an immediate recovery outside of the play being blown dead. There was. So you're telling me the play... So what happened first? The play was blown dead or the ball was recovered? That's a good question. I believe. Hmm. So let's go back to the beginning here with this, with this call, because I don't want to be called out as some kind of hypocrite in any way in regards to the way I laid it out, because here's my thought. Take the rule book out of the equation for a second. Just watching football. I think that's a fumble. However, I agree. However, I agree. I agree. There are two things involved here that, that changed my mind. One is, yes, just in the course of watching a game and showing me a play and saying, is, does that look like a fumble or does that look like a pass? I disagree with the rule book. I think that the quarterback, the ball should be leaving their hand for that to be a pass and not just simply that they're, why, why can't you fumble a football while your arm's moving? Anyway, so I just disagree with the rule. So just watching football, that looks like a fumble. It doesn't look like a pass has been thrown. However, the rule states that if the arm is moving forward, it's a fumble or it's a pass. Therefore, it's a pass. And it was ruled a pass on the field. And much like the Minnesota play in this way, it shouldn't have been reversed. It shouldn't have been <laughs> like, what are oh, they, what just are they like reversing? Kyle, Kyle in the chat. He says the Michigan guy who recovered it looked like he was just picking it up to hand it to the ref. Didn't jump on it, just nonchalantly grabbed and handed it off. So here's the deal. Regardless of if it was, a, I, we didn't get a great view up in the press box of whether it was a fumble or, or not, whether the arm was going for it. I understand based on what I've read and what Kirk said after the game, kind of the, the, the uh, logistics of it and, and whatnot. But again, this is very similar to what you just said, the Minnesota thing with Cooper DeGene. Not, you know, obviously not as big of a moment, but how do you overturn something that was blown dead? Like when you blow the whistle, you are taught to stop playing, right? Guys are taught to stop playing because if you don't stop playing, you can get a unsportsmanlike con uh, conduct penalty or unnecessary roughness. Like why would you keep playing? But yet, you read the rule book and there is some leeway made in the rule book to basically, if there's a clear recovery and even if a pass is ruled incomplete, if there's a clear recovery, then it can be overturned on replay. How does that make any sense? It doesn't. It doesn't make any, that's my issue with it. That's my issue with it. It's not even a matter of, I don't even really care if he fumbled or not, because the bottom line is if you're a good official and there's any doubt, don't blow the whistle. Don't blow the whistle. I mean, this is just like we've seen this so many times. We saw it with Jack Campbell a year ago, and I think it was a return against Minnesota or Illinois. You know, he returns it, and they call him out of bounds. He returned it back for a touchdown. They call him out of bounds. I mean, he was going to make he going to make it to the end zone. They call him out of bounds, and they go back and replay it. Oh, he wasn't out of bounds, but nothing you can do at that point. So if you're going to blow it dead, be sure that you're confident in the call. And guess what? If you make a mistake, that's too bad. 
you don't blow the whistle and then allow things to happen after the whistle. Go back and say, well, if the whistle hadn't been blown, this is what happened. That's stupid. Yeah, it is stupid because these players are coached to stop when the whistle blows. And they're also obligated by the rule book to stop when the whistle blows, as you just mentioned, because <laughs> otherwise uh, they would be flagged. Uh, and, and that's why you see a lot of obvious situations where a ball comes free, whistles blown, the ball's rolling around, and it seems to be obvious of what happened. And you still see players scrambling after the football. <laughs> I have no issue. I have no, I think about it, logistics of that. And I think officials are taught that for the most part. Obviously, I think it needs to be revisited for some of the reasons that we just talked about. Why would you ever blow a play dead if there's any doubt? Like, why would you? Just let it play out. You can go back later and reverse it or overturn it. But the very nature of the game and how the rules are, are stated and what it really is common sense is you cannot, you should not be able to reverse something that never act technically happened because the play was done. You know, it's just like er inadvertent whistles. It's unfortunate, but there's a reason why there's something in the playbook about inadvertent whistles. It stops the play. There, there's nothing that happened. I, I just, anyways, uh, DDB in the chat. Can we address this comment? Because uh, I uh, I did see the, the uh, not the most recent one, but here, I'll, I'll throw it up here, Mark. Um, I want to make clear, if anybody didn't listen to the press conference that we'd had with Kirk uh, after the Tennessee Bowl, Tennessee Bowl, the uh, Citrus Bowl announcement, and, and I appreciate him saying that I, I tried to phrase the question in a nice way. I didn't just ask Kirk. Why is Deacon playing? You know, um, my question was very simple. Um, a week ago against Nebraska, excuse me, a week ago against Nebraska, Kirk made a big second half decision to put Marshall Meter in the game, who'd never set foot on the field. It worked out. It kicks game winning field goal. He did so because Drew Stevens was not playing well. He was costing him points, costing him possessions. Deacon Hill has turned the ball over 11 times in what, eight or nine starts. He's had a couple other fumbles that were recovered by the offense. And that's what I said to Kirk. I said, so when is that going to be applied to the quarterback position? We've seen Phil Parker do it with DBs guys, not performing well. He obviously was winning in practice. He earned his starting spot in practice, but in the game, he's not playing well. Might be time to make a change. We saw that with Drew Stevens. He wasn't playing well in the game. They made a change. Now Kirk's response. And I expected the response. I'll give him, I give Kirk Ferentz a lot of credit. He is consistent with where he stands on this. He went back to, deferred back to the fact that uh, the coaching staff believes Deacon has proved to be the best option in practice. He did make one point that I thought was interesting. He brought up how the one thing we don't know is that Marshall Meter was actually performing really well in practice as well. And I don't doubt that. You know, maybe that's the case. I know Marshall Meter didn't have a great week of practice after that game-winning kick. Okay, the numbers would indicate that he didn't have a great week of practice, but maybe he was having great practices prior to that. So then that would indicate that you're kind of implying that Marco Linez and Joe Labus have not had great weeks of practice. But Kirk said that's nothing against the guys behind them. We're not. I'm not saying they're not. We just feel the Deacon gives us the best chance right now. I, it's just, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. It's just the response does not add up to me. There, There's things that are just not fitting together. It does seem like a double standard. It does seem like the quarterback pos position is evaluated on a different scale. Here's what's interesting, and I don't know if it's been published. Uh, it, it, he didn't uh, give me a whole lot, but um, how do you pronounce his last name? Josh, is it Hupel? Heppel? Heupel. Heupel. Okay, I knew I was pronouncing it wrong. So I asked Coach Heupel, uh, during his media availability on Sunday, I asked him, how do you, he's a former quarterback, right? He's an offensive guy, former quarterback. I said, how do you balance? How do you balance what you see out of your guy in a game versus what you've seen out of your guy and your room in practice? And, you know, I didn't get a whole lot from the response. I don't even, can't even really quote him. I don't kind of try, but, um, I'm going to continue asking that question. In fact, I asked Gary Close, our basketball coach, last night that question. How do you balance those things? Because I, we all can accept the fact that practice would be the primary evaluation time. 
But at what point does what you see in a game just override practice? We just can't keep playing this guy. Hey, he's performing well in a practice. If this guy's got seven interceptions in a game, now that's an extreme case that we'll probably never see, but if he's got seven interceptions in the game, are we seriously not going to make a change? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So that's my question is that what, what is the breaking point? How many turnovers, how many picks, how many fumbles is Deacon Hill allowed to where it ultimately says, hey, even if we believe he's the best in practice, it's time to go to the bullpen. It would be my thought that it would be a reasonable evaluation that if one player is the better player and we'll stay with quarterback, the better player in practice, but the other player is capable. Let's say the second string quarterback makes the right reads in practice, makes the right decisions, but he's being outplayed, not considerably, but decidedly, where it's not even something that Kirk considers. I know who the starter is. I know who the backup is. And let's say no games have been played yet. We're in August camp. He knows the distinction between the two. But we get into the season, and the starter is clearly not meeting expectations You're three games in, he's got two touchdowns and five interceptions, whatever the criteria, that if the backup you believe can function within the offense to some degree where they're making, they can make the throws and they can make the reads and lead the offense, then you give them an opportunity. That's about the best way I can phrase how I would approach it. And I'm not there every day. I'm not there every day, sure. but based on what I've heard, the little bit I've heard, I cannot imagine that Marco Linez is not capable of coming in and giving them even three or four plays. That's what I don't understand. I'm not call- I'm not called for them to make a change, a wholesale change. Would I like to see that? Sure. I'm intrigued by the idea of Marco being able to play a full game. I would just like to see him get a few plays. You're telling me he's not capable of running a few plays two or three plays that you have set in place that he's practiced, that he's comfortable with, with his athletic. I'm telling you folks, he is athletic. He is mobile. He is different than anything else Iowa has on this roster. He's more mobile than Joe Labus, who by the way is in the portal now. And and by that logic, you're telling us that if Deacon Hill was injured, the, the offense would be a complete disaster, even more so than it is now, would be a complete disaster. Well, my guess is Kirk Ferentz would have Double down if if Cade McNamara were playing terrible. My guess is if he had stayed healthy, was playing really badly, he would not have made a change. He would have said, "We believe Cade is the best person for the job." So, you know, Deacon Hill has not played well, but he's being forced to play him. And so, yeah, I I I just uh, it's kind of just a revolving door of answers. It's the same. He's again, he's been very very consistent on this. The argument would be slightly different with Cade because at least he would have a track record of being a capable, good Big Ten starting quarterback in the past. So there would be evidence that he was just in a slump or not quite right, and he was capable of being that guy, of being a good starting quarterback in the Big Ten because he's been that guy. Uh, I would have thought that the perfect time to bring in Marco would have been after the incomplete slash uh, fumble touchdown, 17, nothing. Well, and I don't, as long as you've got good field position, the next series. Yeah. I don't even know that I agree with that just because I think that's putting him in a really unfair situation, but Mark, none of this would, I mean, we wouldn't have to have this conversation if an effort was just made to involve younger guys. And one thing that was brought up in the comment section of the press conference, which I ended up posting on the the channel yesterday, is, you know, Kirk talked about, you know, you got to realize that Deacon doesn't have much experience and the guys behind him don't have any experience. Well, play him and he'll have some experience. (laughs) Put him on the field. Do something. Do something. Brian Ferentz deserves to lose his job. Okay. He deserves to lose his job. I don't have any sympathy for Brian anymore. Okay. Not that I ever really did. I thought the circumstances of how it was done during the season was unfortunate. We can agree on that. But I don't have sympathy for him, whether it's Kirk or Brian. Kirk is ultimately responsible for everything that goes on here. But Brian called nothing on Saturday that even looked remotely new or wrinkly. And, you know, Kirk. He's got a big job now in front of him to hire an offensive coordinator. The unfortunate thing, and I think it's probably an unfortunate thing, is that 
he's going to be waiting until after the bowl game, where a lot of these schools are hiring guys now. Andy Kolonecki down at Kansas, uh, offensive coordinator down at Kansas, just hired by Penn State. He's, you know, a hot name on the market. He was a GA with Coach John Patterson at Western Illinois. Perfect example. Penn State did not delay. They're going to a bowl game. They did not delay, but this is Kirk's style. So who's going to be left on the market by the time we hit January or February? I don't know. And I do wonder if that just means if we don't hear something before the bowl game, perhaps that just means they're going to hire Paul Christ or you know John Budmeyer. And I don't want that. I don't want John Budmeyer. I can deal with Paul Christ. <laughs> okay. For reasons we've talked about, I can deal with that hire. The John Budmeyer hire is going to be hard for me to get behind. And I'll give the guy a chance because at least he's a former quarterback, but nevertheless. You can imagine there was an ACC championship game going on at the same time. So obviously Fox doing this game, most of that analysis outside of the Joel Clad analysis of the game was at halftime with Urban Meyer, Matt Leinart, and uh, who Mark Ingram. And of course, the focus from the Iowa side was the defense is playing at lights out. And they were talking about all the things that the defense was doing well. And Urban Meyer did a whole breakdown of why the defense is this good and what they're doing to Michigan. And then they basically the question was, OK, what do you do if you're coaching this Iowa offense? What do you do to jumpstart things? And but he's just kind of throwing up their hands. And Urban Meyer was like, you know, you just continue to rely on the defense and you hope you can do something. Uh, and then. During the ABC game, uh, you can imagine, again, this has been a narrative that's following this program because of the offense that it was almost kind of like a running joke. Okay, let's get an update from the Big Ten championship game. Iowa still uh -huh, doesn't have any points. Big surprise. Da, 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 da. And, and you're hearing that all night. Well, just remember, and I brought up the style compared with the level of or lack thereof level of offense that Iowa puts on the field each and every week. I mean, we have evidence now, right? Like they have upset teams in the past, but over the last three years with this offense being historically bad, well, I, with the exception being 2021, they managed to do it at home against Penn state, Sean Clifford. I mean, they, you know, more and more evidence we get, the more and more, I think if Sean Clifford didn't go out in that game, Penn state probably wins that game. Because remember, they were up 10 points at the time. They were up two scores. But you got to give them credit. They won that game. They found a way to do it the old-fashioned way, the way that Iowa wins games. But since then, 2021, Big Ten Championship game, they lose to Michigan 42-3. to 2022, they go on the road to Ohio State, try to play this way. Defense plays phenomenal. They give up over 50 and get blown out. This year, they go to Penn State. About Defense didn't give up a single explosive play in that game and they lose 31 to zero on Saturday. The defense was phenomenal. Now, did they give up an explosive? I don't even know that they gave up an explosive play on Saturday, frankly. I don't think so. No. And yet 26, zero shutout. We're not even in the game. Just blow out. You can't win against the best teams this way. And I mean, like we've talked about before, next year, the, the problem is next year, you can continue to win nine to 10 games a year with weak schedules this way. Cause hey, if you get blown out, a, a loss is a loss, a win's a win. But the problem is moving forward, I was going to have a lot more of these teams in the schedule year in and year out. Now, not surprisingly, you have put together a run of games with interesting statistical <laughs> data there of, I know Michigan only had 213 yards of total offense. Doesn't matter. I know Still it doesn't lost matter. I know. Uh, and so you're looking at the last four, four top 10 teams that they've played. They've lost by oh. 39, 31, 44, and 26. Yeah, Mark, this year, think about it. This year against the two best teams in the schedule, the only top 10 teams that they had, really even remotely close to being top 10 teams, Penn State and Michigan, the margin was minus 57. Minus 57. And they got shut out. I, let me just make this clear. 57 to 0 was the margin in those two games. I mean, come on. That, that's not, we can agree that's not good enough. That is not good enough. I, I, you know, you win 10 games, fine. But really? Really? You can't do better than 57 0 against the two 
good to great teams on your schedule. Come on. I don't longest like uh, play from scrimmage for Michigan, 17 yards. Incredible. Incredible. And I brought it up. Here's where one example where Corey was right. Last week, remember what I said about the big play they gave up to Nebraska. And I said, I think that's going to pay big dividends because I bet Phil Parker battens down the hatchets and he, or the, whatever it was that the, is that the right term battens bat? What's the term? The hatches hatches. What did I say? Hatchets the hatchets uh, battens down the hatches and they don't give up big plays. They did the same thing against Penn state week after giving up some big plays against Western Michigan. They do the same thing this week. It's incredible what Phil Parker does. He deserves a Broyles award, but again, those margins are just absolutely unacceptable. And the lack of offense in those two games. Do we have those numbers, Mark? Do we have the numbers for Iowa's offense in those two games combined as far as yardage? Michigan, Penn State? Michigan, Penn State. Well, Michigan, uh, so Penn State was, I just went away from it. It was around 125. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> 125. Are you kidding me? Hang on. It, it might be. Right. I'm just, I'm just, that's just an educated guess. It might be more than that. Penn State was like in the 90s, right? Wasn't it like 90? Okay. The Iowa Penn State game, the total yardage for Iowa was 120 and 35, 155. That's for Penn State? Michigan. Oh, Michigan. I was going to say, yeah, 155. And then Penn State's, it's less than 100. I got it right here. Uh, Iowa Penn State total yardage. 76, 76 so yards, 200 and that 230, 30, 30, 31, 231 yards in two games against you could argue that. I mean, what's the best win on Iowa's schedule? Probably can, at Iowa State. Isn't that crazy? They're yeah. one, they're, they're one, <laughs> they're their best it. win is at Iowa State. <laughs> Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. I, I would never oh. make fun of that because they, they they're a good football team overall. When, even when you put the the lousy offense into it, they're they're a top twenty team in right. America. And they win. We've talked but, so much about how they win. We talked about this heading into the game. They win differently. But the bottom line is, against the elite, the evidence is overwhelming, overwhelming. And yet, the evidence is also overwhelming that the defense can compete with those teams. It absolutely can compete with those teams. A guy who was up for offensive for assistant coach of the year nationally, Sharon Moore's Wolverines, they gained what two thirteen, two thirteen, and they and they were playing with the lead. The whole, I mean, you know, they could theoretically, uh, the playbook was open, completely open for them, playing from ahead the entire game. And yeah, I mean, the bottom line is there were a couple of short fields that were created, one due to the turnover from. Deacon Hill that may or may not have been a fumble the other due to the 87 yard run. But I mean, you just look at the game. Iowa just was so good in space with tackling. And really the only negative is they had a couple opportunities at, at uh, turnovers that they didn't capitalize on one being the Nick Jackson one. I don't know what the score was when he dropped that pick, but that came right to Nick Jackson. It's probably either 10 or 17. Was he going to, do you think he had, from my view, it looked like he had a shot. I don't know what kind of speed Nick Jackson has in the open field, but you think he had a shot at returning it? He would have gained a lot of yardage. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Probably in field goal range, and you would expect Drew Stevens to make, knock on wood, make that field goal. This is not an apples to apples comparison, but UMass gained 33 more yards of total offense against Penn State than Iowa did. It's not apples to apples, but it's a. It's fair because we've seen similar types of, I mean, numbers when we looked at total offense and you see some of these G5s that are, yeah, playing against worse competition but are gaining substantially more yards, yardage, game in and game out. You know, look at all these different points of evidence collectively. Now, once we get to next season with a new offensive coordinator, it's going to be intriguing to see what is the offense going to do under somebody else. So is it is it larger than Brian? Is it development is it all these other things that could oh it's larger be... than brian it's larger than brian but i think the only way to jump start it and accelerate the growth is to change more than just your offensive coordinator if you just get a different offensive coordinator who's going to just change play calling 
Maybe he gets a couple of people out of the portal. I don't think that's enough because I think there ha- there are some serious philosophical problems that need to be corrected. And I really do believe, and I don't think Kirk is micromanaging play-by-play calling from Brian and from his other OCs, but there needs to be some significant rope where Kirk just steps back and says, this is your baby. I'm going to work with George Barnett and this out. If George Barnett keeps his job, <laughs> frankly, I don't know that he should, but if George Barnett keeps the job, Kirk needs to say, I'm working with this offensive line and your focus of the OC is to develop a scheme that fits what we're doing up front with our old line and with the personnel we have and what we can get in the portal. But I am not going to be inflicting my will upon what happens here. Let's see how Phil Parker's guys, how this defense and special teams units, these two units that are fabulous can complement a new look offense. Let's just see what happens. I don't know if Kirk will do that. I doubt he does, but I think that's what needs to happen. And I doubt if Kirk does this, but he should. And other programs at his level will be doing this this offseason, even with a starting quarterback. They will go out and get another quarterback in the transfer portal to compete for the job. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I you know what? I, I'm so overwhelmed by the portal right now. And I say that because last year Iowa hit so big in the portal in, in our minds, at least. And, and they did in some regards. I mean, Nick Jackson, what an ad that was. Yeah. Caleb Brown was the best skill position player they had in the team late in the year. Uh, had some problems with drops, but still huge. And then, of course, Kate McNamara. But I mean, like, in general. Eric Hall. Eric Hall, absolutely. Um, probably would have been the most important offensive player down the stretch for Iowa had he not been hurt. So, like, in general, they did really well in the portal last year. I'm just so overwhelmed by the portal right now with all these guys in and all these quarterbacks from all the, I mean, almost every top quarterback from every conference has just decided I'm going to put my name in the ring. And I'm, I'm finally to the point where I love the sport, but I think this is just not good for the sport. <laughs> it's just, oh, it's a lot of people have been saying this for a long time. I, I'm just kind of, I'm just kind of like, you know, this is ridiculous. Come on. This is just like open free agency every year. And I'm getting real tired of it, um, but got to play the game. And Deontay Vines is in the portal. We didn't mention that. We should probably mention that before I hop off here. Deontay Vines is in the portal. Uh, here's the one that surprised me, and I haven't gotten I uh, reached out to Ontario yesterday. I know he's probably getting flooded with schools. have not gotten a response from Ontario Thompson. Surprised by that. Just given his story, his background, he just got to Iowa, blocked two punts for Iowa this year, was going to have a chance, I think, next year to work his way into the defensive line rotation. He is in the portal. That was a surprise. His old teammate from Iowa Western, um, Jackson Filer, who I believe was a preferred walk-on, also in the portal now. Deontay Vines is in the portal. That's not a surprise. Joe Labus is in the portal. That's not a surprise. I don't think there are any guys at this point that would, if like the only guys that would surprise me if they entered the portal would be like, I don't know, a Cade McNamara. Like if Cade entered the portal, I'd be like, whoa, what's happening here? <laughs> but I don't, it sounds like Eric all based on the intel I've gotten, it sounds like Eric all is moving on. Got to remember he's, he's a father now. And he's probably going to have an opportunity, assuming he gets healthy, to earn a spot in the league. Um, it sounds like Iowa's got a, sh- a good shot of getting a couple other guys back. Same for a while, I think Luke Lachey, there's a, a good chance he surprises some people and comes back. Um, but in general, they're going to have a lot of new faces. And I just hope that what we saw in the portal last year can to an extent be carried over to, to this season because you have to compete every year in this with this uh, new system or you're just compete or die, especially with the new Big Ten coming. Lemansky, thank you so much for the uh, super chat uh, in Phil Parker, I trust. Also keep in mind, folks, that you can listen to our weekly show with Corey at From the Hawkeye of the Storm on your favorite audio platform if you want to listen to um, – the the weekly show that we do and of course join Corey each and every day at from the hawkeye of the storm all right Corey, appreciate you being here making this happen as always absolutely mark thank you i would just like to remind everyone that uh we are moving our nebraska show so nebraska corn huskers live it's on the huskers channel of course here at the voice of college football typically on Tuesday nights, but with the playoff rankings coming out each week, we have moved it off of Tuesday night, but we're back on Tuesday night. So please join us at seven Eastern in just about 45 minutes, seven Eastern six 
Central for our Huskers live show. And if you want to go over there and stir up some trouble, you are allowed to do that, Hawkeye fans, and get uh, on over to our Nebraska channel. Appreciate you being here at the Voice of College Football. Let's see here on a Tuesday night. Anything else available for us? Michigan Live at 8 p.m. Eastern time as well with John DiAdamo. So it's Nebraska Live at 7, Michigan Live at 8 on those respective channels. Otherwise, we will see you again back here next week on Hawkeyes Live. Next Tuesday, 530 Eastern, 430 Central. Bring some friends with you, and uh, we will see you then.